भी को जिंदाबाद वेलकम टू द नेक्स्ट टॉक ऑफ दिस सीरीज पैगाम आजादी the series was started by school for democracy in collaboration with news click to commemorate the 74th anniversary of india's independence this uh, lecture series is based on our freedom fighters whose contribution made the dream of independence a reality looking back at history is not only important for us to learn from it but also to inspire ourselves and to understand how we reached at this particular juncture and uh, how we move ahead from here especially in these times of fake news and misinformation and disinformation it is really also important to set the record state, straight uh, we have uh, perhaps succeeded to some extent in establishing the socio political structures and institutions we wanted to establish in an independent india but still the dreams of uh, india's many freedom fighters are far from be being realized in every lecture uh, we'll talk about one such personality and listen about their work ideas and visions uh, from a special guest uh, so that we can know what inspired and guided these personalities we had the inaugural lecture on maulana azad by saida hamid and uh, one on jawaharlal nehru by ramchandra guha uh, you can find the links for these talks in the description today's talk is based on bhagat singh who when we think of his name we can immediately think of the revolutionary zeal but he left a legacy far more than what he is known to the common man for his writings which included his vision for an independent india get lost in the picture that has been painted about him today we'll try to get to know more about this man and his idea for india for this we have with us today said irfan habib Irfan Habib has worked in the area of history of science as well as political history. After teaching history for a few years, he joined the National Institute of Science, Technology and Development Studies at New Delhi. He spent more than 30 years looking at the intellectual and institutional foundations of modern science and technology during the colonial phase in India. He later moved to the questions of interface between local indian knowledge traditions and modern knowledge which came along with colonization in his more recent work he has raised some fundamental questions centering around diversities of knowledge and cultural practices in india and elsewhere around the world besides a large number of uh, papers and books he has also written on bhagat singh his book to make the deaf hear ideology and program of bhagat singh and his comrades has been translated into several indian languages He recently put together a volume on Indian nationalism, the essential writings, and another one called Inklab, Bhagat Singh on religion and revolution. Till recently, he held Maulana Azad Chair at uh, the National University of Educational Planning and Administration at New Delhi. Besides being a Fulbright Scholar, he has been a visiting professor at several universities in India and abroad, including Cambridge, uh, MIT, State University of New York, and many others. Irfan Habib ji thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for agreeing to do this over to you thank you so much thank you thank you so much and uh, i am really happy that uh, uh, school for democracy uh, thought about uh, including bhagat singh uh, into this program and then thought about me to come and speak about him thank you for that uh, today uh, when we think about uh, our india the india we are living in this india has been uh, a result of a huge churning which went through uh, for 100 years large number of people uh, got together from diverse backgrounds diverse ideologies and commitments uh, to build this new india in which we are living today and one of the one of the people who actually was participant in this struggle to build new india with a vision was bhagat singh man was was too young to 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 actually contribute very much uh, in the building of the country but he was certainly someone who had a, a who had rich ideas who was committed to a certain vision a certain uh, idea of india and that idea of india he has left behind as as legacy for us unfortunately in this country where everybody has turned nationalist overnight and uh, as if nationalism didn't, didn't exist in india before 2014 as if india was built by by aliens 
who had nothing to do no, no, nothing to do with nation uh, india as a nation or who had no idea of nationalism or they were not patriots enough so all this has come about in the past 6 7 years and uh, all these people like bhagat singh they are used as nationalist icons because it is very convenient to use them as nation nationalist nationalist icons because it takes forward their idea of vulgar nationalism which is being used every other day to not to actually promote the country but to uh, but to run down others the fellow citizens again and again sometime on the base of religion sometime on the base of class sometime on the base of caste all sorts of categories are used to run down their fellow citizens by a large number of people sad thing is that this thing didn't happen overnight and i say it again and again this has been there this has been part of our our politics but it never had and this this sort of open state patronage today all this is being done by state patronage that is the fear that is the most dangerous thing which is which we are going through and which i keep reminding others also keep reminding that this vision which is being blurred the vision which bhagat singh left behind so many others left behind is being is being vulgarized is being misinterpreted is being misused and very conveniently used to promote a certain brand of politics a certain brand of nationalism so our idea is to save people like bhagat singh and their legacy from this poaching which is going on you no know? we we need to tell people that bhagat singh actually didn't stand for this flag waving aggressive nationalism you no know, which was divisive he was not that he was he was very different now with this background uh, let me come to what bhagat singh was now when we talk about bhagat singh we talk about several things what were the influences on bhagat singh which were how bhagat singh became bhagat singh what all he read you know what was his background you know all that comes into picture which i will talk about later we need to see what is actually bhagat singh's family background no not many people talk about it bhagat singh was born in a family which was a family of freedom fighters not only freedom fighters a family which was committed to the values which bhagat singh took forward later in his life for example bhagat singh's uncle ajit singh no bhagat singh's uncle ajit singh was someone who organized the peasantry you see look at look at the period it it is before jallianwala bag it was early 20th century 19 1910s no 1908 1909 no that is a period the the other phase the early phase of the freedom revolution revolutionary struggle in that phase ajit singh bhagat singh's uncle organized the peasantry in punjab organized the workers in punjab spoke about their rights spoke about their exploitation fight against imperialism so i'm saying this because this is what bhagat singh did in his later life so he saw this happening in his family his own father was a congress activist sardar kishan singh he was close to gandhi he was close to the congress party he went to prison several times one of his another uncle swaran singh died in prison you know because of tuberculosis because he was incarcerated for for long he died in prison so this is the background which bhagat singh grew up in and his uncle ajit singh finally left india for 37 years came back to india in march 1947 at the request of jawahar lal nehru and within few months on 15th august look at the look at the date on 15th august 1947 he died in in dalhousie so this is the background of bhagat singh's life early life so all the politics which he inherited was this politics politics of fighting for the poor fighting for the underprivileged fighting for the peasants fighting for the farmers so this is a this is a lesson he learned from his family now this lesson he takes forward when he grow, grows up, grows up he was a man he was a man with uh, with faith and he uh, talks about it that he actually was actually belong to a very 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 strange family he he was a belong to a family which was a are samaji sikh family you won't find any such families are samaji sikh family now 
so so he used to bhagat singh has written in his vai mein atheist also that famous pamphlet i will talk about it later uh, that he used to recite gita uh, he had a commitment to god his letters also if you read so they keep changing he is using all the religious metaphors categories to address and to say bye bye uh, in the letter all that was inspired by his faith later on all that disappears as he evolves as a, as a as an intellectual so so this is a life which bhagat singh actually led right from the beginning now what were his his commitments his commitments were first his commitment was to build an india which is which is uh, uh, which is plural which is secular which is socialistic which is i uh, people actually talk about the demise of uh, communism in the world i don't think that has any anything to do with bhagat singh or the relevance of bhagat singh because bhagat singh's values the ideals he stood for are relevant even today because he talked of the poor he talked of the marginalized no he talked of of all those who were deprived that section is is has not disappeared from society that section has increased number numbers have gone up so the the values he espoused what were not really uh, theoretical marxism no or organized marxism he himself was not part of any organized marxist political party no and this is also a question which people raise again and again to me also that why did he not join a communist party which was founded in 1925 no and there are answers for that which uh, which i have dealt with elsewhere now the point is the values he stood for the fight he stood for the the mission he had in mind as a young man that mission is unfulfilled so his relevance continues his relevance continues even now his commitments continue even now now when you look at these three four things uh, which he, which were close to him look at the revolutionary activities he, he, he was involved in and you except for one the the murder of uh, saunders in lahore uh, after uh, lachpat rai's death that is one one uh, you can call a terrorist activity whatever the name you want to give you know, where he was involved in taking a, a life of a of a human being and he regretted later on in his pamphlet so many of his writings etc and he never again participated in anything and in anything which was which was uh, a danger to human life indian or foreign now and it is very clear in all his writings again and again all other activities of his are linked to his ideological commitments for example the throwing of the bomb in the assembly where did he go and throw bombs in the assembly in 1929 8 april 1929 he threw bombs because the british government was bringing a legislation passing a resolution legislation on public safety bill a legislation on against the rights of the workers the labor the labor movement both bhagat singh and bhagat singh and his associates they had been writing against it the british government refused to listen finally they decided let us go and make the deaf here no the, the the government is deaf they are not listening let us make some noise and that is how the bombs were tested and i say it again and again when people say that this was violence they were aimed at taking people's lives no bhagat singh should have done that there were important people sitting in the in the in the in the lok sabha which is lok sabha today the same building no it was the same building which we have lok sabha today uh, where jinnah was sitting motherlal and nehru was sitting so many other senior leaders were there but people should know that these bombs were tested in agra no they had an office in agra they tested these bombs and they could see that the bombs should actually only make noise and smoke they should not hurt anybody three four times the bombs were tested this all record available one can read that so it was there was a commitment that human life should not be affected the idea was to wake up the sleeping government and this is what they did the bombs made noise bomb made smoke and all that and they, they were arrested so idea was to take forward the ideology the commitment which they had 
commitment for the worker for the for the for the labor class for the for the for the poor and to make the, the colonial government aware that this is this is what we want which you don't want to listen and we are making some noise so at least now you can listen to what we are we are trying to say so this is this was the idea this, so this was a reflection of his and his comrades commitment to the cause they stood for so even the revolutionary action reflected what they actually wanted you know the ideological commitment they had bhagat singh did one thing very very significant in his life he tried to institutionalize the the ideas he stood for because the revolutionary party the hindustan republican association which he joined in 1924 and hindustan socialist republican association which he himself transformed in 1928 in delhi in ferosha kotla where they had where they had a meeting and that meeting added socialism to their revolutionary organization which which is known to people large number of people now in 1926 before this he did something significant he formed a public platform as a young man called naujawan bharat sabha so naujawan bharat sabha was an organization which was which was a public platform which bhagat singh founded he himself spent a lot of time later on underground after 1928 but naujawan bharat sabha remained a very active platform is spread all over up punjab and and uh, and uh, and uh, rajasthan western up particularly it was a platform which organized a huge meeting in 1931 after bhagat singh was hanged and congress session was held in karachi subhash chandra bose was invited he came to participate in congress session but he was invited to deliver a special lecture in naujawan bharat sabha conference which was held next to the congress uh, pandal and subhash chandra bose spoke so eloquently about bhagat singh and his ideals his politics his vision and which included socialism which included secularism which included pluralism scientific temper gender justice all sorts of issues were, were touched by subhash chandra bose and these were all very dear to bhagat singh himself so so naujawan bharat sabha became a very very important platform and it was created by bhagat singh and his associates and this was again an extension of his ideological plan program and commitments so these were institutions now what did there are few things which are relevant in today's context we keep talking about about slogans today there is lot of fight over slogans which is a slogan which uh, will make you a good nationalist bharat mata ki jai no jai hind bande mataram no Oh, these are these are slogans which are being used to divide people, you know, without even having an idea that in freedom struggle, most of the slogans actually were are inheritances from from our freedom struggle. You know, we didn't we didn't have these slogans during the ancient period or medieval period or whatever. You know, they were born hundred years back when we were fighting the British. And different leaders, different people at different occasions coined slogans, which we used. no whenever whenever whatever we needed at, at at whatever time we use a slogan so there was no one slogan which was a standard slogan which could be called a nationalist slogan which will make you a nationalist so that was not true now look at naujawan bharat sabha naujawan bharat sabha in one of their one of their programs declared that we don't believe in slogans which are being used by by lots of nationalist uh, till now and this is a i think matter of 1928 to 27 the slogan which which uh, congress party or even other nationalists think unites people like nara e takbir allah ho akbar for muslims no like sat sri akal jo bolo so nial sat sri akal for six har har mahadev aur bande mataram for hindus all these three slogans were used in public meetings so that you could bring together all three communities or reflect upon or include all these three communities now bhagat singh says that this is not our idea of india we want only two slogans to be used 
इनकलाब जिंदाबाद हिंदुस्तान जिंदाबाद नो दिस इज हाउ आर इंडिया इफ यू यूज दीज थ्री स्लोगन एंड मेक पीपल कॉन्शियस दैट दे आर मुस्लिम एंड सिक्स एंड हिंदू दैन then you are not doing a, a great service to the country or to 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 nation or nationalism so this is divisive you you are reminding people that you are you are divided you are muslim you are sikh you are hindu we don't want that we just want two slogans inqilab zindabad hindustan zindabad workers of the world unite so this this was the only idea so they they actually countered this openly and in their meetings never such slogans were ever used once they decided not that they were against bande matram they were not this is also uh, 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 like uh, something used against them they were not against bande matram if want somebody wants to use it fine but that cannot be a measure of my nationalism or anybody's nationalism no so so their own commitment was in qalab zindabad and hindustan zindabad that was the main main idea they wanted to have another important uh, thing which uh, is relevant today and which not many people actually are aware of is bhagat singh's bhagat singh's writings his vocation as a journalist you see he didn't become a revolutionary overnight no he began he began as a scribe and he started writing when he was 16 or 17 he died at, at 23 23 years and 4 4 4 5 months so he didn't really have a long life and his active life was 6 7 years so he began writing and participating in public life political life from the age of 16 or 17 the first article he wrote in hindi in 1924 and he was born in 1907 imagine what was his age In 1924, he was he was in his teens. You can't even imagine today a young man of this age to think coherently. Forget about writing. To think on a subject like universal brotherhood. Universal brotherhood is such a difficult subject to write, and he wrote this in a magazine called Matwala in two parts, which used to come out in Calcutta. So this was the first article he wrote. So. when he started writing he began he began from uh, matwala then he he joined the editorial board of kirti kirti used to be a paper used to come out from uh, from amritsar it was a, a paper started by sohan singh josh who was um, was a labor leader was a present leader you know socialist workers party uh, so so he invited a singh man from lahore to to come and be on the editorial board so he he wrote a series of very interesting articles in 1928 and these are few things which we need to we need to remember today in today's india because most of those articles are so relevant even now like for example in may 1928 he wrote a piece called achhut ka prashna achhut ka sawal a question on of untouchability now untouchability is such a such a serious issue even today no there is something so sad that what bhagat singh wrote in 1928 what he found as a serious problem in 1928 india is a serious problem even now no so these are when i am not really happy when i say that bhagat singh is relevant even now he should have been irrelevant because all these problems should have been solved because these people are relevant because we have not done enough to take to take their ideas or take their vision forward lots of things have remained incomplete and this is one the question of untouchability <clears throat> what bhagat singh says he says lots of things and i will just touch upon two which are relevant today he he while writing he writes about conversion now conversion is a major issue all the time it keeps cropping up and he says why are people talking talking about conversion yeah? conversion will happen in this country where you have discrimination no when you have more than 6 crore people whom you have declared untouchable they can't enter your kitchen a dog can enter your kitchen but an untouchable can't enter your kitchen you know dog can come and sit in your lap but untouchable if he touches you you become impolluted 
So in this country, when something like this happens, obviously people will go to any religion, Islam or Christianity, where they are respected, you know, where they become human you know, from, from, uh, from un un untouchables. So he's writing very clearly in that. So this is what, what is happening. So we need to mend our own house. No, you go and blame the British that the British are not giving you uh, equality. You peep into your, in your, into your uh, uh, this thing first and see what are you doing to your own people for centuries. Then ask for equality from the British. If you don't treat your own people e with equality, how can you ask the British to, to treat you uh, with respect? So the, these are the words of a young man in 1928. So he was conscious of the fact that we, are a, we have been a divided society. We have, we have made a large number of people suffer. We have insulted a huge section of our population, made them conscious that they are, they are, not, they are not equal. They don't deserve to drink the same water from where the upper caste drinks. So these are issues which he is trying to raise. He is, he is bold, you know, and I'm really surprised that he, he in that uh, article, he says that in our country, we have senior leaders of the Congress party of the country, people like Madan Mohan Malviya. He takes his name that he, he goes, he goes to, uh, to the meetings of untouchables. He invites them to the, to the dais, hugs them you know, in public, goes back home and takes a bath with his, with his clothes on. No? So this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a politics we are, we are trying to play with them. So the respect, you, in public you do something, you, in private you do something. So these are things which Bhagat Singh is trying to raise. And he's bold enough to say, even as a young man, name the people. You know? He names Lala Lajpat Rai. No, he names Madan Mohan Balviya. Lajpat Rai becomes an active member, supporter of uh, Hindu Mahasabha. And Bhagat Singh and his, and his associate, Kedana Sagal, they bring out actually a, le a leaflet against uh, Lajpat Rai. The same people go and, and take avenge his death. No, when he's injured in 928, in a demonstration. So, so there is no, there is no, uh, hatred towards anybody, respect remains, but disagreements apart. He knew, they knew that Lajpatraya is our foremost nationalist. And any attack on him is an attack on Indian nationalism, Indian nationhood. And his death is avenged, but disagreements are there in public. They have written so many. Uh, Bhagat Singh himself wrote so much against him and against his politics. His support for capitalists, his support for communalists, no, all that is there documented in, in, the, in the book which I have just published recently. I have included some of them. But one, can, one can see all that. So this is the politics which Bhagat Singh was part of. And one need to keep in mind that his nationalism, and let me come to that nationalism part, because that is something, something so, so rampant today that uh, everybody is talking about nationalism. Every act of today's government is a nationalist act, whether it is demonetization, whether it is uh, anything, you know, anything can be linked with nationalism. So, so the point is, what is this nationalism about? You talk of, of Bhagat Singh, you use him as an icon, you celebrate his martyrdom, but you don't talk about uh, his ideas. No, you can't celebrate him as a martyr only. You, know, you just remember him on 23rd March, Garland is a photo, that's all. And then end, then wait for the next year. The point is, Bhagat Singh has to be alive. He has to be lived every day. His ideas have to be lived every day because he is not one of those uh, martyrs, one of those nationalists who, who just went to the gallows and, and just gave away his life for the country, which he did. But he did much more than that. He left behind an intellectual, intellectual legacy, a written, uh, uh, written uh, corpus, you know, which we need to, need to read and understand. That's what we are not doing. The point is, we need to understand what Bhagat Singh is. 
and that that can that is possible only when we we read what he wrote unfortunately that is something so difficult to do you know, because raising slogans or garlanding uh, uh, statues or photos is so, so convenient and it it actually does the job that you remember him or remember anybody for that matter but if you engage with the ideas then it becomes a serious challenge because then it challenges your 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 own belief you have to change according to the ideals which you have uh, inherited from people like bhagat singh that's what we are not supposed to do we are not prepared to do you know we are only ready to use him as a as so that our own political ideals political vision of today is strengthened you know so you don't bother about the past you don't bother bother about the future you only concerned about the present so how you use bhagat singh is the and his ideals for the advancement of your present political concerns so we need to save bhagat singh at least remind people that bhagat singh stood for something else today another thing which uh, we need to understand and which is so rampant today is the role of the press the media we keep talking about media we keep cursing media for its role for its uh, for its complicity in what is happening around us look at bhagat singh in 1928 in july 1928 issue of uh, of kirti he writes that the press today so irresponsible he is writing in 28 and he is writing about print media there was no other media available there was no tv channel and he says that media is so irresponsible today they are they use they use provocative headlines to divide people you know they they incite people they use communal communal slogans you know they use caste slogans you know this is irresponsible press the role of the press was to build composite nationalism there's a word the bhagat singh's word not mine the the role of the press was supposed to be composite nationalism shared nationalism shared idea of india to bring people together to be inclusive all that is being denied all that is being forgotten by the press today instead they are trying to divide people they are trying to incite people against each other they are using all sorts of communal categories and incitements to divide india so this is something being said in 1928 so what is happening today is not something new no people like bhagat singh were conscious or aware of the dangers of irresponsible journalism even in 1928 which was not a free india which was a british india the battle was still going on so these these are ideals which we need to recollect what bhagat singh had left behind when bhagat singh goes to prison uh, after he is arrested from uh, the delhi assembly the two years close to two, two and a half years we spent in in uh, lahore prison he matured he matured further because he got lot of time to read if you read his uh, if you see his uh, prison diary which is now uh, printed also available in public i used it when nobody had it you know i think i was the first person to use it as a researcher in 1981 79 79 80 the uh, the printed uh, the the typed copy had come from russia uh, mitrovich uh, was one of those uh, russian scholars who took, the, took this diary with him from bhagat singh's brother kulbir singh from faridabad and in 1970s and then he got it typed and uh, somebody came and i got hold of it i was working on bhagat singh in those days and uh, it had not even gone to the archives and uh, because his brother didn't hand it over to the archives he kept it for so long with him in good he went to archives and all that became a public document now look at this prison notebook the prison notebook gives you an idea what bhagat singh was reading uh, what all he was reading from literature poetry economics history constitutional issues international national all these all these issues 
are there, his notes are there, and one can understand the mind uh, of Bhagat Singh by, by reading all that. The last <clears throat> article which he wrote uh, from there is a, an appeal to the young, appeal to the young, uh, young Punjab, young India. Uh, it's a long sort of article which, which gives you an idea of the literature he has read. Everything is there. He quotes a large number of uh, uh, like authors and uh, experts in that, in that article, uh, the last article, 3rd February 1931. And the best and the longest piece he wrote was Why I'm an Atheist. That also was written in, in prison. Now, when we see the title, Why I'm an Atheist, generally people think, that it must be uh, some sort of a harangue against God. No, no, something abusing God, his existence, no. which is there, of course, but it is something more than that. Why an atheist is a, is a very, very special document. It speaks about so many things over there. For example, it talks about scientific temper. No. He, talk, he talks about rationality. He talks about rational behavior. He talks about questioning mind. He talks about questioning everything inherited. You know, Urdu, mein, it is called taklid. You know, you inherit a tradition. So anything inherited from the past need to be questioned, whatever it is. Don't, don't follow anything blindly. These are all, I'm just summarizing what Vaivanathi says. Don't follow anything blindly. Put a question mark on everything. Use your brain to understand what you have inherited. No? Understand the existence, even if you are a believer, understand the, 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 the existence of God. Try to question Him. No? Don't, don't just blindly follow. So these are large number of things. Then another thing which he says, and he's saying in the context of Gandhi, then, but it can be used in the context of present day India. He says, don't follow anything blindly. Don't follow any leader blindly. Even if he is Gandhi. Now, that's what he's saying by an atheist. Don't follow anybody, any, any leader, even if he is Gandhi, without understanding, without critically analyzing, without critically understanding. So this is a lesson which we need to take from Bhagat Singh today. If we are a great follower of Bhagat Singh and if we really follow him, then use your brain. See what your leader is doing. What is good in him? What is bad in him? No, bad should be called bad. Good may be appreciated if there is any good. But don't don't be blind. You know, when you are following a leader, a leader can can falter. Leader can never always be right. So this is the lesson which Bhagat Singh is trying to convey in Bhagavad Gita. So these are issues which which is raising in that important document, which we need to. Remember, which we need to uh, take along, develop, and make them live. You know, so Bhagat Singh is not dead for us. He's alive because his ideas are alive. You know, when his ideas are alive, when his ideas are relevant, then, then the man is not, uh, not a martyr. You know, he's not dead for us. He's alive for us. Because if we can engage with his legacy, use it every day in our everyday life, political life, social life, intellectual life, then he's not dead at all. So he's, he's like Keats, he's like Shelley. You know? These are all people who died very young. You know? Keats died very young, Shelley died very young. But, but those people you remember very easily, they were poets, you, know? you, can, you can easily follow them. But people like Bhagat Singh, who died equally young at 23, leaves behind a very, very difficult legacy which is not very easy to follow, which is very convenient to ignore because that's how, that's how you, can, you can remember him. Because if you follow him, then you need to do a lot to reorder your life, you know? redo your life, reconstruct your life. Because Bhagat Singh was not a reformer. He was a revolutionary. He didn't believe in reform. Reform means you keep the pillars of the house standing. He wanted to restructure everything. And that is the difference actually he's trying to make in one of his very, very, very interesting uh, articles uh, on, on uh, Suvashan Bose and Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, he's comparing the two in 1928. 
in one of the articles. He says, Suhash Chandra Bose is a, is a romantic. He is a romantic. He is a reformer. No, he talks of the past. He talks of the inherent the, the, the tradition. No, he talks of cultural values, etc. You know, he wants to keep the pillar of the house standing. He don't want to redo everything. He wants to make a reform. But today's India doesn't need that. We need to redo everything. Demolish the structure. Build a new. And it's only Nehru who can do that. Because he's a Yugantakari. That's the word he uses. He's a Yugantakari. He's a revolutionary. No? And he believes in restructuring the society. So these were his views, 28. What would have, his views would have been later on, had he been alive, that we are not sure. But in 1928, these were his views about both, these both, both the leaders. He said, Suvash Chandra Bose is an Beng emotional Bengali. These are the words he's using. He is an emotional Bengali. No? While Jawaharlal Nehru is a realist. No? So, th so these, are, these are understandings of a young man at the age of 23, 22, when he wrote this. And which we need to which we need to follow. Unfortunately, we don't even bother to understand this. Bhagat Singh is not relevant only for India. He is relevant for South Asia. He is relevant for United India and Pakistan. Most of his most of his but like Lahore was his karm bhumi. No, whatever he did, he did in Lahore. He was he studied there. His political activities were in Lahore. He was hanged in Lahore. So Lahore was his karm bhumi. He did everything for, for, for in, in Lahore from that uh, from that city. So he has a huge following in, in, in Lahore itself, in, in Punjab also, among Punjabis, large number of them. So his values, and actually he's the only one, he's the only one who can be a shared hero. Gandhi can't be a shared hero. Nehru can't be a shared hero. Maran Azad can't be a shared hero. Suvash Chandra Bose can't. Bhagat Singh is the only one who can be a shared hero of these two countries. Despite all our problems, Bhagat Singh is the only one who unites us. And I, I believe that we have to be, both these nations need to take his legacy forward. If, if any time peace descends in the region, today nothing is possible because everything is in such a bad shape. If things improve, whenever they improve, I think Bhagat Singh is one person who can bring India and Pakistan together, at least culturally together. So there are values which we should cherish, which unfortunately we have forgotten. The values which Bhagat Singh has left behind, the politics he has left behind, the, the struggle he has left behind, the, the goals he has left behind, the goals still unfinished, unachieved. All those goals need to be, need to be achieved. And Bhagat Singh stood for all those goals which we are missing today. Things which, which we need to do today. And Bhagat Singh is one, one person who can really take us forward to, to reach those goals. And unfortunately, uh, a large number of people don't even bother, don't even think that those goals have any value or they are worth pursuing. And that is the reason why, why we don't take all that seriously. The point is, if we, be own, we ourselves become serious about, not only about Bhagat Singh, about all those all those great minds you know, who, who, whom we think are irrelevant today, uh, let us salvage, let us bring out whatever is salvageable in their ideas. And there is a lot which we can find to, to instill into our programs which we are taking forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irfanji. Thank you so much for uh, this talk. Uh, Thank you.